This is PT Pro Talk, the podcast for physical therapists who want to improve their clinical skills and be more successful. I am Mariana Parks, physical therapist and your host, and today I interview Mark Thiel to discuss managing patients in the emergency department setting. We talked about what the role of a PT in the emergency department is, the type of patients you see and how to manage them, the importance of using the McKenzie method in the setting, and much more. Mark is a PT with over 25 years of experience and a senior clinician at Bar One Health, Geelong, Australia. His work involves primary contact roles in both the emergency department and PT-led specialist clinics. Mark is part of the teaching faculty for the McKenzie Institute Australia, is an educator for both the theoretical and clinical components of the McKenzie Diploma Program. If you find this information valuable, please subscribe to our channel, hit the notification bell for updates, give us a thumbs up, and share with other clinicians who could benefit from this conversation. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy the show. PT Pro Talk is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Sarah Health. Remote therapeutic monitoring sounds great, but also difficult. Sarah Health makes RTM simple and easy for your patients and providers. Check out sarahealth.com slash ptprotalk for a special offer. Hi, Mark. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So let's get started uh, jumping right in. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your career, your background. Uh, yeah, thanks. So I've been a physiotherapist for more than 25 years now uh, in Australia. Uh, in the last 20 years, my work's been um, in my hometown of Geelong and nearly all that work's been at the, uh, the local uh, regional hospital, which is a, a major regional hospital in the state of Victoria. I um, have spent a um, few years, first few years working there on the wards, but in the last um, 15, actually it's, it's longer now, 18 years, I've been involved in primary contact roles, firstly uh, in the orthopaedic screening clinic and in the last 15 years as a primary contact physio in the emergency department. I also do some work with the, the local university, uh, School of Medicine, uh, um, some uh, clinical tutorial work and um, in just a couple of afternoons a week I do some private practice work. Very good. Um, and I'm very, very curious to ask you about your role as a uh, primary uh, contact provider, right? So you're working on the ED. So what is your role as a physiotherapist there? Yeah, so if we just go back into the early um, 2000s, uh, before the primary contact roles really got up and running, uh, it was traditionally we would have a physiotherapist in the emergency department in a secondary contact role. So the doctors would screen patients and if they felt that there's a need for physiotherapy, uh, whether it be from a mobility issue or in order to help out with their uh, musculoskeletal problem, they would call the physio, whether the physiotherapist was there working or whether they were on the wards and they got called down. And sort of it was on a part-time ad hoc basis, but in the mid-2000s, the, the role of the primary contact physio really started gaining momentum and being rolled out in major hospitals, certainly in Victoria, and, and also around other major areas in Australia. So uh, I started, the, the role in our hospital started in 2008 and I come on board after a few months. And the primary contact role is where the physiotherapist is basically um, based in the emergency department. And so instead of having the doctors see the patients and then refer to the physiotherapist, we pick up patients independently and we assess diagnose and treat them independently, but with also having the consultant as a backup in case we need um, to run patients by them or for when we need to do more advanced um, um, 
modalities such as imaging or or medications such as analgesia. So that's why we need the the doctors there for those things. But most of the patients I'll see on a um, on a day to day basis, I don't need to run by the doctors. I treat them independently. That's very interesting. And why do you think that change uh, that you mentioned that in the early 2000s, the, the role of the PT started to change? And do you know why that happened or how uh, that happened? I don't know the ins and outs, but I, I think the big reason is is, uh, is it, having physiotherapists that are well-trained uh, and certainly the, one of the criteria we have for our staff uh, is they need five years experience of musculoskeletal uh, work but it was thought that with skills in musculoskeletal and and seeing patients with musculoskeletal problems such as sprains and basic fractures and also back pain um, it can help provide specialized care for these patients but most importantly I think this is the main reason what it does do is it frees up time for doctors to see sicker and more urgent patients. And certainly the UK, they, they, they were ahead of us and, and was rolled out in the UK before us and, and Australia um, has adopted that model and with great success. And certainly uh, research that's been done uh, on, on the implementation of primary contact physio uh, in Australian hospitals shows that it does decrease the length of stay for patients when they're seen by uh, physiotherapists. The satisfaction with patients is, is certainly um, at, at a good level and um, it's also their waiting times. So, um, but we need to be careful interpreting all research. There's always limitations and we probably need more, but it does appear that it has reduced um, the, the, um, the stress and the load on, on, on doctors um, and also provide beneficial outcomes for the patients. But it's probably important to note that whilst that's happened, the numbers that are presenting to the emergency department in Australia continues to grow. That is very, very interesting. And, and that's something I don't think that is as common in the US as it probably is in the UK and Australia. So I'm always curious to, to learn more about that. Um, so like when the patient comes in, so how is the triage process? How does it work? Uh, yeah, it's probably worth me pointing out before we get to that is that when we talk about an emergency department model uh, and also the, the primary contact role, uh, it really depends on where you are in the world. Certainly the system here in Australia is, is quite different to that in, in, in the US. So hospitals, public hospitals, uh, emergency departments are of public hospitals are, are funded by the government. So when a patient presents to a public hospital in Australia, they don't have any out-of-pocket expenses covered by our Medicare. Certainly we have private hospitals and some of the ho private hospitals, we have two of them in our region now, do have emergency departments, but they incur out-of-pocket expenses. So with the cost of living, um, we, we, we are seeing uh, more presentations to the emergency department because there's no out-of-pocket expenses. Uh, that, that's only one of the reasons. Um, there are other reasons why people present to a public emergency department. If we look at the, the triaging system, uh, we have a nurse and half the time we have a, a doctor at the triage um, front desk and the patient presents with their problem and they're triaged by the nurse in the category of one to five, one being most urgent, needs to be seen within two minutes. So that might be someone that uh, has, has a very low GCS or is unconscious, um, to someone who, who is a cat five. So a cat five is someone who's had a problem for uh, six months and it doesn't appear like there's any major alarm bells or, or, or problems with their presentation, such as they sprained their ankle uh, six weeks ago and they're ambulating and they've still got some pain. So with a patient with a cat five, uh, the, the recommend well the guidelines are we need to be seeing those patients within 120 minutes. So you can see that there's a, a, a big uh, gap between urgency and, and patients uh, inform that that they may have someone that turns up after them that gets seen quicker. 
And as the physiotherapist working in the emergency department, we will typically be seeing the patients that are Category 4 and Category 5. Some of them will be Category 3s as well, but it's very rare that we'll see Category 1s and 2s. Definitely not 1s, anyway. And then the nurse that selects where they are going or what provider they're going to see? Yeah, so we work in what we call the fast track area, although unfortunately on some weekends when it gets totally overloaded, it's not so fast, but it's, it's the lower acuity, uh, the ones that are not typically sick uh, or unwell, and that's just an arm of the emergency department um, as opposed to the general department. Um, yeah, the, the, the thing is with the fast track, although they have already been triaged and they've been um, sent to the fast track area, we, we've got to be really careful because some, some of these patients that sneak through to the fast track area may have signs or symptoms that haven't been um, disclosed or, or identified at the triage system. So in part of the training uh, with the physiotherapists in the emergency department, one of the things that we have to get really good at is, is, is screening very well. Uh, and ruling out any of the serious um, physical or medical problems and identifying or understanding the ones that we can't treat, where we need to get the doctors involved. So this, it's a really important skill to have and the assessment is really the crucial part of it. Um, I always tell people the assessment is, is more important than the treatment in, for most of our patients that we see in the emergency department. Yes, absolutely. And... And how does a normal day look like to you? What type of patients do you see? So we, um, we are mostly seeing patients with limb complaints and, and, and most typically traumatic limb complaints. Uh, so sprained ankles, uh, sore wrists from falling over, um, knee pain. We also see, do see patients with atraumatic limb pains, but we need to look at the triaging um, closely and sometimes it's not really relevant but when we're talking about atraumatic limb pains we need to be careful that, that, that there's not medical problems uh, underlying their presentation. An example of that may be um, knee pain that presents atraumatic. Um, we need to be uh, mindful of conditions like gout or pseudo gout or even a, a septic knee um, and patients that may have calf or thigh pain, we need to be wary of conditions like a DVT. So we are trained to be looking out for that. We certainly, we don't treat that. That's where we need uh, the medical staff involved. But that's an important skill for us to have to make sure that we're not missing something uh, that is more a serious medical problem underneath. So that's the limb side of things. And we do see back pain, which is one of the... Um, prime reasons why the doctors love us being in the emergency department because they can often be um, slow to, to get going. Uh, they take up uh, often a lot of time in the emergency department, particularly with the doctors and for physiotherapists going on the front foot and getting these patients moving early, it often helps to uh, increase the, the, improve the flow of uh, patients going through the emergency department. And certainly neck pains, we will see some neck pains as well, but when it comes to back and neck pains, it's not common we'll see the ones that are traumatic for obvious reasons because of the risk of uh, serious pathology, but the atraumatic back and neck pains we will commonly see. Okay. And just curious to ask you, how often like, do I identify like red flags and conditions that you uh, need to refer out? Is that like common or not as uh, often? Well, I mean, quite often we'll see patients that will present with red flags uh, that we then need to escalate their care, whether that involves more advanced imaging, uh, like a CT or an MRI or, or uh, pathology testing like blood tests. So that's, um, I won't say it's common, but it certainly um, happens uh, where we see patients and we need the doctors involved. When it escalates to actual serious pathology is less common, uh, but certainly when we have enough red flags in a patient's history, we get the doctor involved and that's when we start escalating their care. Okay. And like if you need to get an imaging, can you order as a physiotherapist? Like what is the, like what is your scope? Can you order imaging exams or you just refer or talk to the doctor? How does it work? 
Yeah, so we order all our x-rays. Um, that's that's uh, not an issue. Um, when it comes to uh, CT scans, ultrasound scans and MRIs, uh, it's just the hospital's policy that we run them by the consultant in charge and we will speak to the registrar from radiology to discuss the patient as to why we want uh, either an urgent scan, as in done within that day, or as an outpatient scan to be done within the next few days. Okay, cool. And any like other blood work and things like that, do you order that or, or no, it's not? No, so, so any, any pathology testing is done by the consultant in charge. So if a physiotherapist ordering uh, blood tests you have to pose the question, why is a physiotherapist ordering blood tests? Um, for what reason? Uh, there, there would be that indication there's probably something medical underlying that. And when there's something medically mm -hmm. underlying it, we should be getting a doctor involved. Same thing with medication, probably. Yeah, so we, we can't prescribe uh, in Australia. We, we can, certainly when the patient's discharged, we can recommend over-the-counter analgesia um, but we can't prescribe in the ED, so we have to get the doctor to prescribe uh, analgesia, which is really it's the only thing that we're wanting for our patients that we need the doctors for. Uh, and in terms of uh, discharge, when, when patients are giving scripts, we can't write them either. We have to get a doctor to write a script for them. So that, that's certainly one of the limitations of the, of the primary contact role. Um, the rise of nurse practitioners in, a, in Australia is certainly, um, there's definitely a need for it um, and there's still a big void. Um, they've filled a lot of gaps in, in not only big hospitals but also in rural er areas as well. Um, they, when they go through their proper training, they can prescribe. It makes a huge difference in terms of patient flow. It's an area mm -hmm. we as physiotherapists haven't um, really gone to that level and certainly been looked at. Um, but it's, it's, it hasn't progressed along the line greatly in the last um, 10 to 15 years, but it's certainly uh, a next phase that we may, in Australia anyway, we're, we'll be looking at, um, not me personally, but the body will be looking at in order to try and improve the quality of care. Yeah, it makes sense. And how about going back to back pain that you mentioned that you see mostly atraumatic, atraumatic back pain? So how how does how do you treat them? Like, in what what tools do you need, and like what skills that are important to treat those patients? Uh, so with with back pain, it's it's important to assess the patient thoroughly. And what I mean by that is most most importantly, when a patient presents to ED is we need to take a good history and screen the patient to rule out serious pathology. And why we do that is because it comes back to my question I always ask myself when a patient presents the emergency department with back pain is, why are they here? What, what, is, what is the patient's mindset as to why they present to, to an emergency department? And certainly, when we look at some of the data and research over the last 10 years as to why patients present to the emergency department with back pain, there, there's a variety of reasons. And um, the thing we need to be very careful of is don't just assume they present because their pain level is out of control. We see patients that walk in with back pain that, seriously, you get patients walking around in the community that are in more pain than what they are. So it's important to ascertain from the patient as to their, under, their reasoning why they present to the emergency department. And certainly other reasons are, and, and the two most common are because of pain and reduced function, but certainly other reasons are is because they're fearful something's, something's wrong. This is different to what they've normally had. Um, they get different symptoms. So it's that fear level or they can't access their GP. That's a common complaint we get. Uh, certainly GPs in Australia are, are overloaded and they have a spike in their condition and they can't access their GP. We do get patients um, presenting wanting an image uh, and with their public health service, their perception is they go to ED, they can get a, a, a free MRI scan. Um, so so um, other, other things may be because of work have sent them or a family member have sent them. And 
also a perception that they get faster and higher quality of care. So it's important to firstly to take a good history to make sure that you can either uh, we will identify any relevant red flags and to rule in or rule out whether serious pathology is um, in play here. And as we know, the majority of people that uh, have an episode of back pain uh, don't have serious pathology. The second thing is, is to identify what's the patient's mindset. Um, is their anxiety out of control and they're catastrophizing their symptoms and they need to be calm, basically talked down about it being a musculoskeletal condition? Um, or is it they just simply can't access their GP and they're wanting advice or analgesia to help them get through so they can see their primary care provider, whether it's GP or, or physical therapists, uh, in the next few days? So the assessment is really important and, and and really asking them all the relevant questions about their health and about this presentation, uh, their aggravating and easing or better and worse um, positions and movements, and also doing a, a good but appropriate physical examination uh, and, and particularly um, their a neuro, uh, also a gait assessment if, if, if that can be done in the, in the short stages, sorry, in the early stages and where possible uh, looking at their ranges of movement and quality of movement. So that's really the assessment side of things. And, and for my, my, in my mind, I think that needs to be reasonably thorough. Uh, at the very least, the patient will have the perception that they've been listened to and they've put, been put through the relevant screening. And from a management point of view, I think feel that that's where us as primary contact physiotherapists have really come on an added value to the emergency department. Uh, we certainly are more proactive in giving advice about patients or strategies or movements about advice in terms of getting them moving and, and, and improvement and also about appropriate follow up with patients as well. Cool. And um, I want to ask you about when you say fear, I imagine a lot of them walk in the emergency room with a lot of fear. Uh, so you have to spend a lot of time probably or some time with education with those patients, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to try to calm them down. So that would be like a big piece, important piece of the treatment as well. I think it's a huge part of uh, treatment of patients with back pain in the emergency department. And I think one of the benefits I've gained from working in the emergency department, I've become very good at identifying that when patients, when I see them outside of the emergency department too. I think as clinicians, we can fall in the trap of uh, seeing a musculoskeletal or mechanical problem and treating it uh, appropriately without identifying uh, the patient's um, relevant psychological situation. And it, it is really important to identify when patients have fear uh, or, or anxiety around their condition and addressing it appropriately. And, and certainly one of the best modalities I use with some or a lot of the patients in ED is talking them through their concerns, uh, talking them through that, listen, I've taken all this history from you, nothing in your history is concerning. If we do an image today, we're going to be none the wiser. There's no indication for your imaging as per the international guidelines on back pain. So talking them through things, listen, when you sit, your pain gets worse. When you get up and move, your pain gets better. That is very typical of musculoskeletal back pain. And that's something that we can work with and your outlook here is positive. So really talking them through, that, through with patients, in some cases I feel is better than analgesia. Uh, and, and that's part of the one of the key pillars is education. If we educate our patients well, I feel we can set, our, set them up for success once they leave the ED, rather than uh, that, that cycle of where they're going around and potentially representing. So we talk about the role of a primary contact physiotherapist in the emergency department. I feel that treating back pain is one of the key areas that we have come, come in and done well. Not only um, it's seeing these patients and, and getting them moving in a timely fashion and discharging from the ED in a timely fashion, but the education we give them around what the condition is, what the expectations are likely to be, 
and, and what they need to do, particularly around their, their positioning and movements that they need to do in order to help that situation get better. Very interesting. And mechanically, so you you have the you know the MDT. Um, and I was thinking about if the patient's walking, probably most of them are chronic, but I assume you're going to see a good part that are acute as well. So like, are they more in the chemical stage? Do you feel like you can help them as much with the MDT or how is, how does it work? I, I feel that anyone presents to uh, an outpatient setting or an emergency department, I feel that yeah, any patient that presents with back pain, we can help. Uh, it's just a question of where that, ha how much percentage of help we can give them and whether that is in function, whether it's in movement, whether it's in pain reduction, whether it's centralisation or whether it's in reduction of fear. Some patients you're going to get more gains in those areas than others. Some patients you're going to get more gains in the mechanical and less in the psychological and vice versa. So really uh, identifying the patient, how they present, what their biggest problems are, and trying to address what their biggest problems are in trying to achieve the best outcomes for them immediately, but more importantly, in terms of moving forward from there. I mean, a good example of that, uh, and this might be going back on what, where you're trying to head with this question, someone presents with a, a very acute radiculopathy, um, ongoing constant pain for a few days below the knee, some paresthesia in their foot. We assess them, uh, we exclude serous pathology, and the patient we identify as struggling to be up moving around, better off lying down, uh, having constant pain throughout the day. So with that patient, what we will want to do once we've excluded serious pathology, we want to try and optimise their positions and movements that decreases their pain. Uh, and that situation, they are probably unlikely to be showing signs of centralisation. But if we can optimise their pain reduction through positioning, we also can talk to them about pain medication, which might also help with the, the improvements. But with these patients, we're more likely to get gains through the psychological in terms of telling them this is likely what's going on in terms of you have an irritated uh, nerve system. And we know that these ones are slower than the musculoskeletal back pains, or what we talk about in, in, um, in, in McKenzie terminology, a derangement. Uh, this, rather than days seeing improvement, it may take weeks, but we want to see those steady gains happening over the next uh, one, two, three weeks. And also talk to them about the additional modalities that can be considered down the track, such as a, a nerve root injection. So we're giving them a pathway. We're giving them light at the end of the tunnel um, and we're not committing to it. We don't say, well, in six weeks, this will be better because when you say that to a patient, it's probably not going to happen. But we say to them, it's likely to improve over the next few weeks, but you just need to be not looking at things on a day-to-day -day basis, but looking at things every few days to see whether things are changing, whether that's pain intensity, the paresthesia, pain location, movement, the ambulatory status, and just generally their psychological state. And just helping them with position, I think it's it's huge because then it helps to calm everything down so then they can respond later, uh, respond better mechanically to a, another assessment, right? I, I always, when I teach, I always say to uh, students and, and, and other clinicians that I think as a patient, the worst place to be in is the land of unknown where you don't know what's going on and you don't know what the future holds. And I think if we can give our patients some clarity in terms of a, a diagnosis is a bit vague. When we talk about derangement or mechanical back pain, it doesn't mean a lot to patients, but if we can give them a practical explanation, I think more importantly in that, in, in that early stages, it's about telling the patient what it's not. This is not the serious stuff. This is not the one to two percent that is nasty. That's going to involve urgent medical um, attention. So this is this is musculoskeletal, or or it's a, a ridiculous problem. And this is the pathway moving forward. So giving patients clarity, I think, is really good medicine in itself. And that comes back to assessing the patient pro properly, 
and being confident in your delivery, and, and particularly when you have volume with these patients, you're going to be much more comfortable delivering that, um, that, that education to the patients that you're seeing. And then if they need continue the treatment, do you refer them out to like an outpatient setting? Yes. Yeah, so, so some patients that uh, I think will improve very quickly, uh, I'll talk to them about that, about whether they think they need follow-up and suggestions. Uh, but a lot of those patients, they are probably going to do okay on their own. But in that mid-zone uh, and certainly when they're quite restricted, it, it is uh, important, I feel, that they get followed up, at the very least with their GP from a medical point of view in terms of analgesia, but with a, uh, a physiotherapist, whether it be in the public system or, or privately, in order to just help guide them through the process to continue making gains rather than deteriorating and then ending up back in the emergency department. So certainly a referral or, and that doesn't need to be a referral from me. They can certainly self-refer in the community, but I'll advise certain patients that I think it's um, optimal that they, they do get follow-up. Good. And do you have like a certain amount of time that you have to see those patients or it depends on how, if it's busy or not in that day? That's probably one of the differences between the emergency department and uh, an outpatient setting is uh, that, that there's no time limit. We certainly have uh, guidelines from the, um, the governing bodies that we try and get all our patients that are low acuity out of the emergency department within four hours. But the reality is, is that's not always going to happen because they may be quite um, resistive in terms of improvements or just from a personality point of view, uh, but also just in terms of the bulk coming through the emergency department. Uh, certainly on weekends, it can get very busy. But I don't have any uh, time constraints in terms of I have to get this patient out of here within two hours. So. Some with back pains, typically I'll give myself a, a, a mental time frame of between two to four hours that I try and get them out of there. The ones that come in non-ambulatory or via an ambulance, yeah, certainly it, it may take longer, but most of the patients we will get out of the emergency department at home within a three to six hour period. So that's okay. probably one of the big benefits that um, we have in the emergency department, we have time and certainly Getting a patient in an optimal position where we can calm their pain down uh, and leave them for periods of time like 15 to 20 minutes and come back and check is a very beneficial modality of treatment for a lot of these patients. At the very least, if it doesn't greatly calm down their pain, it can certainly calm down their psychology and help them to uh, try and improve when they do need to go and move. And just the other thing that we do have uh, at hand in the emergency department that uh, listeners probably don't have is the access to strong analgesia where required. Yeah, so that's helpful too. Um, so that was when you were talking about it, I was just thinking, so it's cool that you can see a lot of patients at the same time, so you can leave them there in a position or trying something and then probably see a lot of patients um, in that same period, right? You gotta be careful, you're not juggling too many balls though. <laughs> Don't drive yourself too crazy. Yeah. Uh, and that's where it becomes a team effort as well too. Yeah. yeah. So you have a lot of other PTs working with you? No, no, there's only one physio that's working in uh, the emergency department at, at one time, but in our team, we'll have a, a, a senior doctor um, and a, a junior doctor and a nurse practitioner and we have um, a nurse as well. Okay. And curious to ask you about MGT. So how do you use that in that setting? And like, what is the importance of the MGT in the emergency department? Yeah, so I need to uh, put my McKenzie hat on now and um, reveal my biases. So <laughs> obviously I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm part of the, uh, um, I'm, I'm current chair of the McKenzie Institute Australia and, and, and teaching faculty. So th there's my disclosure. Um, and certainly I've been utilising the McKenzie system uh, for, for years now, um, but, but completed the diploma in 2013. 
And I get asked this question a lot. Uh, so this McKenzie stuff, so do you ever get to use it in ED? And the answer is I use it all the time. It, it, it is the framework to what I do with patients. So we know the strength of the McKenzie system. It's applicable to acute, subacute, chronic. It's applicable to all musculoskeletal conditions. So I'm utilising it in ED. Um, let's look at our back pains, for example. I'm going through extensive questioning in order to rule out serious pathology. And when I get a red flag alerted, I ask the next question and the next question in order to identify, is this something I need to escalate or, it is, or is it not? In the history, I'm asking about the patients, what have they been doing in recent times in order, in order to try and identify what may be the aggravating or provocative factors that have led them to where they are. I'm looking for their pain location. I'm looking for centralization or peripheralization. I'm looking for directional preference in the better worse section and a preference for loading. So that, that not only helps with the, uh, the classification in terms of ruling in or out serious pathology, it helps with my classification in terms of derangement, which is the most common that we will see. And I'm also looking from a management point of view, I'm looking for whether there's a preference in terms of loading and directional preference that helps guide me and the patient in order to get the best outcomes for the patient, not only in the emergency department, but more importantly, when they leave the emergency department. Because a lot of these patients, we may not get great gains in the emergency department, but we're confident with our classification or diagnosis and our management strategy and more particularly I'm referring to there as in terms of directional preference, we're pretty confident this patient should get better. And that's the information and the education and the confidence that we can install in our patients. And so how do you instruct them like in regards to progressing? Do you say like, oh, if you feel better in one week, try this or try that? I will, I will, but I'll pick my mark. If it's a patient that's got a lot going on psychologically, I think we need to keep it very basic and just settle for uh, those short, quick wins in the earlier stages. And they're the patients I think will, will likely benefit from being followed up in the next few days. For those patients that show good progress in the emergency department, um, I'll talk to them about this is a progression that you can start doing in the next few days as you feel better. Uh, so it's really, it's a decision I make guided on uh, where the patient's at the time, the progression they make in session or in the emergency department, and how, how beneficial it will be by giving them extra information in terms of their progress. Uh, and that, that's really a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. And, and do you see a lot of derangements, just not in spine, but like extremities? and in, in all? In the emergency department? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we do. We do. Um, certainly for those patients that present with um, subacute problems, I, I, I rolled my ankle, I twisted my knee uh, days ago or, or three, four weeks ago. It's still problematic. Um, less, less clear, harder to identify when it's very acute within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, but no, we certainly do see them. And that's, I think, one of the strengths of having the MDT, the McKenzie system, is you can help progress the patients and give them that ownership and that, uh, that, that, that confidence to start moving their joints in order to get their optimal outcomes. And does it happen, uh, the patients go back to see you, they're like, oh, you helped me, I wanted to, to you know, keep doing the treatment. So how, how do you deal with that? <laughs> To, to represent to the emergency department? Yeah, so, about? yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I think that the mindset um, of the emergency department is we don't really want patients to be representing to the emergency department unless things um, escalate or worsen. Um, certainly there are some conditions that are on the moderate to severe scale that will send them home uh, it, this is probably more medical patients rather than musculoskeletal patients. But if if they don't improve, we advise them to come back uh, within a few days. A good example of that is someone who um, falls over uh, and and on an outstretched hand and injures their wrist, and we X-ray them and we don't see a fracture. 
But we know that when patients present to ED um, with wrist pain post fall, it's more than likely that they actually have a fracture rather than not. So we need to be very mindful of that. Um, certainly not everyone that presents to an ED with wrist pain post fall has a fracture, but a lot do. So if we don't see a fracture, we may splint them or we may not, depending on the patient, but we'll give them advice. Listen, if things haven't improved uh, in the next few days, this five to seven days, it's probably uh, advisable that we represent or, to, or your GP for further investigate, further assessment and or imaging. I mean, back in the uh, days when I trained, when we had acute injuries, we would x-ray them and if we would tell the patient, if it's not better, we'll review in about 10 to 11 days and do repeat imaging. So we have more advanced imaging more readily available now, such as CTs and MRIs, which can basically give us our answers quickly. But the issue we have there is uh, cost, but probably more so um, accessibility uh, for, for patients, particularly in, in rural areas. So some patients, we will advise them to, to represent, uh, and certainly with the very acute back pains where they don't make great gains uh, in session, but it is preferable if they go home rather than we keep them in hospital. And that's something we can talk about shortly, but we say to them if things escalate, um, and also the red flag questioning. If you start having issues with your bowels and bladder, you need to represent urgently. So we need to give them that information and education about when to represent. In terms of patients representing again, yeah, we, we discourage patients from representing with stuff that we don't feel needs to be seen in the emergency department and be followed up in the community, such as with their GP or physical therapist. You will get the occasional patient that is attached to what the treatment or the management they had the previous time and they rock back and they say, oh, I want to see that physiotherapist. The reality is, is we have different people working on um, different days. So uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a raffle in terms of who's available and we're only during um, 9 to 5.30 from a physiotherapy point of view. So they come out of hours, we're not there. And the other thing too is depending on when they come, they may have to wait two, two hours um, depending on how many people are waiting there. So it, it, it's, it's not something we encourage patients to present to an emergency department because we don't, and this, this is talk worldwide, we don't want emergency departments clogged up with non-urgent stuff because it, we, we need that flow to be happening for the more urgent patients that, that present. Yeah, and since you mentioned about fractures, I, I wanted to ask you, so how does that treatment of fractures work in the ED? Yeah, so we talk about the use of MDT, same again with the, with the, with the limbs. Uh, I, I utilise my, um, my McKenzie model. If we look at why the patient presents, uh, we need to be first and foremost uh, understanding how they've got the how they've got the the problem and whether it's a mechanism or not. And if it's a mechanism, are we dealing with a bony injury such as a fracture? So uh, we think about, and this is what we talk about with the doctors when we're having uh, problems in the extremity. Uh, the three T's: tumor, trauma, and temperature. So. They're the main things we're looking for with uh, an extremity problem uh, from a serious pathology point of view. And the majority of patients that we see in the emergency department, we need to be identifying whether they have a fracture or not. And so we do a, an assessment, a, I would say modified assessment, an assessment based on how the patient presents. But in a lot of cases, we will go to imaging uh, so our our investig sorry our physical examination won't be as detailed until we have an X-ray that either rules in or rules out a bony injury, meaning fracture. Well, if if it's not a fracture, that's when we can look at the patient and start investigating more in terms of uh, range of movement, quality of movement, and looking for directional preference. But as you know, some of those patients are very acute injuries, and we can only make certain gains. Uh, but it's it's the advice that we give them that they take home that's the important part. Okay. And if you had to say what is the most common uh, issue that you see, is there like a top one or top three? Uh, are you talking about in terms of um, limb injuries? Yes. Yeah. So Any... the sprained, sprained ankle is the most common. Uh, 
followed by fractured distal radius and I'll probably say, yeah, the uh, distal fibular fracture. So the Weber, one of Web, Weber A or Weber B fractures, they're probably the most common. Uh, and when I say distal radius fractures, I'm talking about kids as well. So they, they you, you, ankles and wrists uh, on a weekend will probably make up half our presentation. Okay, okay. Um, Mark, anything else that you want to add before we transition to the final questions? Uh, no, no, it's um, it's it's a very rewarding job that I have in the sense that uh, you certainly um, you, you can leave a shift thinking you're doing a fantastic job, but uh, you rock up to your next shift and you leave thinking, gee, there's a lot I don't know. There's a lot I don't <laughs> know, and and you certainly have some insecurities about yourself. But over the years, I've adopted the mindset that I'm on an exponential growth. Uh, um, pathway working in this emergency department there's so much I don't know um, but gee I've come a long way and and the fulfilling part for me is where with to the best of my abilities I can treat these patients and provide good outcomes for them but also sharing it with my colleagues so I'm involved in in, in obviously with the teaching with the McKenzie um, Institute but also with uh, colleagues that come through and and start training as physiotherapists in the emergency department, I'm heavily involved in that as well. But also do some um, some tutorials, obviously with the, the School of Medicine, but also with the registrars um, in the emergency department, more specifically on back pain, because it's an area that they don't feel greatly confident with. And certainly um, doing tutorials with them has been very rewarding because it greatly improves their confidence. Because when we're not there, they have to see them. And so at least giving them a starting point in the platform is hugely beneficial for them and their confidence and the outcomes for the patient and also the organisation. Yeah, just imagine that's so challenging because you have to see so many different things and you have to know a little bit about everything and, you know, and... Yeah, well, we, 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 have, we do have a scope of practice um, for the primary contact physiotherapy. Um, so... There, there, there are patients that we um, won't be seeing because it's outside of our scope of practice. But an emergency doctor, the expectation is they have to be seeing everyone that presents into their uh, into the emergency room. So their their depth of knowledge over a variety of conditions is um, it, it's a lot. It's a lot to digest, yeah. and, and and certainly if they can get more understanding of musculoskeletal problems like back pain, it really improves their confidence as well. Yeah, I talked to another PT that works in the ED, but in the US, and she was saying she needs to like research every day something different. She was like, I feel like every day I'm Googling or researching something that comes up, yeah. so. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I tell my colleagues, I say, I learn something, at least some one thing or more every day I work in ED. Uh, and, and that's the mindset I have now. You know, as I said, I'm on this journey of just growth and development, and uh, there there is something or multiple things that I'll learn every day. Uh, because we need to understand, we're not doctors, and we're not expected to be doctors. But having understanding of uh, other conditions, uh, certain conditions that may uh, be involved or or mimic a musculoskeletal problem, such as uh, a, a DVT or such as, as gout or other medical conditions um, is, is, is important. Um, it's not a core part of our training, but they're things that we, we learn as we go uh, that helps you to best identify what the problem may be and, and the best management strategy. And you certainly need to enjoy a dynamic environment with no routine. You don't know what to expect. Every day is something different. Yeah, so. it's important. I think in the early days I would... Uh, preempt what, what, what my day was going to be, I would rock up and think, okay, now, how many back pains am I going to see today? Whereas I, I've got to that uh, level in my uh, career and, and, and certainly my maturity um, has occurred in that I don't even think about what I'm going to see. I, I don't even think about the emergency department until I get in there and I log on and, and then just see what's on the screen. So I think we can use up a lot of a uh, lot of wasted energy and, and certainly increase our own anxieties by trying to preempt um, what's going to come through the door. Uh, and, and certainly I know that's hard when you're in the training phase, 
um, but when we can um, turn up and then deal with what's in front of us, uh, it's certainly very reassuring. And equally, it, it's very beneficial for me now when I leave the emergency department. I, I don't go home and, and uh, ruminate about what's occurred in ED. I don't lose sleep now, which is really beneficial uh, because it, we, we need to have a life outside of work and and that's taken time and, and, and confidence, but also confidence in I've done my best whilst I've been seeing those patients and I've, I've made sure that there's nothing serious going to occur and we've done the best for the patients. So, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a, a, a time thing and a maturity, um, a maturity aspect. But, yeah, it certainly is a common thing that I hear from clinicians is that they, they worry. They, they worry um, about what they're going to see uh, and they ruminate. They ruminate about, oh, NED, uh, did they do the right thing? I think talking them through things um, is important so that they have a positive psychology, uh, particularly when they're not at work. Yeah, you have to learn how to deal with stress, right? Because you are under stress. Uh, yeah, it, it, it can be a stressful environment, that's for sure. And, and one of the key ingredients to helping reduce that stress is is good communication, uh, good communication with the patient, but importantly, good communication with your colleagues. Uh, it, it's essential. Yeah, very good. Um, Mark, any resource of information that you recommend our guests to go check? Could be any research or anything about the topic or anything that you enjoy at all? When it comes to working in ED, there's probably a couple of things that um, I think are really good resources. Uh, the first one is uh, the, um, the the framework for identifying red flags for serious pathology and lower back pain. So that's a uh, was a, a paper or a framework that was put out in 2020 by uh, Laura Finnegan and her her crew, mostly based in the UK. Um, it's a very in depth read, but they've done an excellent job. And I think all clinicians, doctors included, probably should have a copy on their uh, on their laptop or their hard drive, um, just to give some foundations for what red flags are. It talks about basically all the red flags that uh, we, we we may come across with lower back pain, uh, and which which ones probably have more weight than others. And it also talks about the level of concern and when we should be escalating and when we should be carrying on with our management. So I think they've done a fantastic job. I, I certainly uh, guide clinicians in that direction to um, at least read it, um, but also hold on to a copy because it, it really is, um, I think when it comes to serious pathology and lower back pain, I think it's as good a guide as any. Um, but uh, yes, it's, it's lengthy, but it's also very achievable for you to be able to um, read and digest. So that's probably one thing. And the second thing, which may not be as relevant to a lot of your listeners, is um, the paediatric guidelines for fractures and fracture management. So the Royal Children's Hospital in uh, Melbourne have put out, uh, it, it, it's um, on the online um, and it's freely accessible, is the Royal Children's Hospital Melbourne um, paediatric fracture guidelines. And it is a great framework for types of fractures that we will see in kids and how we manage them. We know that the majority of paediatric fractures, because we see kids with fractures, the majority of paediatric fractures will um, be managed conservatively, uh, but it, it gives guidelines in terms of when we need to refer them to, a fra to orthopedics urgently versus when we, need, we should be getting them follow up with a fracture clinic within seven days and a repeat x-ray versus happy to be followed up with a GP versus don't, doesn't need follow up and remove their splint in three weeks and happy days. So it really gives a good um, generic guide in terms of how we should be managing um, pediatric fractures. And that's a very different skill that you have to develop that we would not yeah. need on our day to day usually. So Yeah, so it's certainly a skill that um, is different to what most physiotherapists will, will go through in their day-to-day -day, um, work uh, and, and, and what they've done in the past. And, and it's a skill that we've had to, all of us that work in the ED have had to um, develop. Uh, it's interesting because uh, in the Melbourne hospitals, um, a lot of them don't actually see kids. Uh, 
so so we're uh, I won't say unique, but we do see adults and kids where we are. So that's that's important when people come to work at our hospital that they're upskilled in terms of assessing and managing um, paediatrics with injuries. Yeah, just keeps adding on the challenge. <laughs> Different type of populations, yeah. Uh, and what would be uh, your advice to clinicians that are starting their careers? I think uh, be curious and stay humble. I think be curious because our curiosity uh, helps drive uh, our passion and energy and certainly can help keep you in the game, uh, whichever it be, uh, for long periods of time because a lot of us have to work for a long period of time and part of that being curious, uh, like I said to you about always learning, is don't be scared to ask questions either uh, because if we can challenge our curiosity and, and, and answers are provided, uh, I think that that helps um, satisfy, our, uh, satisfy our, our, our role and our job. And, yeah, I think staying humble is important uh, that we don't know everything. And really, we, we're expected to have a basic level of knowledge, but um, we, we're not expected to know everything. And there's always people out there that know more about things than what you do. And the important thing is to tap into it. Most people are really willing to share their knowledge base. Tap into that uh, and it will improve your personal development. It increases um, the knowledge and the development of those around you. Uh, and, and more importantly, the benefit is to the patients that you see. So it's important to remain humble and, and understand that you don't know everything. Don't be scared to ask questions and learn off others in order to provide growth for you and others, and more importantly, your patients. Yeah, that's very true and, and very important. Um, and our patients always prove us that we don't know everything because when you think you figure it out, then something completely different shows up and, and you're like, oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah, and I think that's probably another thing too is, is, is to be honest. Um, I'm really good now at, at being upfront and honest with clinicians, um, not pretending. Uh, I, I think we can become, in our early years, we become defensive because we're expected to know things, um, that we, we can bumble our way through. Um, I've got to the level in my career where I, I, I know what I know uh, and but also I'm aware of what I don't know and I'm willing to try and find that out. And as I said to you, every day something pops up that I don't know and I'm willing to try and find it out. Um, but I, I'm up front with clinicians. I actually don't know that. Um, and I'm up front with patients. We don't know the answer to that. And, and I suppose one of the benefits we have in the emergency department is my my backup line is I can check with my doctor in charge um, whether they have the answer to that as well. So um, I think that, that honesty and transparency is really important um, because it, it just really um, sets the scene for, for everyone. And builds trust between yeah. you and the patient. You're being honest, yeah. so they, they trust you. Um, yeah. Very good. Uh, Mark, if people want to learn more about you, or um, is there a way they can find you or uh, contact with you? I'm not on social media. No it's, social media. It's, ne <laughs> it's never been my thing. Uh, no, I don't. Um, I don't. Uh, I obviously teach uh, within the McKinsey Institute uh, courses in Australia. Um, I'm part of the McKinsey Institute International Diploma Program as well, um, with through the theoretical component. Uh, also have the uh, the clinical school here in Australia, um, but in terms of um, external teaching, I don't do any other external teaching. Uh, I save a lot of that for the um, the staff and internally in the organisation I work and the university. Um, but no, it, it's it's I'm I'm more than willing to share my knowledge base with people like yourself. But in terms of any any courses, I I don't have anything else um, that that I that I do on a, on a regular basis. You are busy enough. <laughs> you have enough oh, you on your plate. <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> Depends on who you speak to. Oh. <laughs> well, I thank you so much for coming on and sharing all your knowledge with us. Uh, it was really 
interesting to hear your perspective and your day to day and your experience in the ED. I think it's very different. Um, and I appreciate you coming here to share. Thanks very much, Mariana.